Yes, what I did, I, I didn't really know how to base this talk on the basis that for the new people in the club, there's a lot of pe things which they probably aren't familiar with. But at the same time, HF has got loads and loads of aspects to it, and it's impossible to cover all of them in um, the sort of space available uh, tonight. But, and also, usual sort of thing, lack of time to get a PowerPoint sorted out, but I thought, ah, oh, I've done talks like this in the club in the past. So I looked after my computer, my regenerated files from my corrupt hard disk, <laughs> and found this talk I did in 2012, which was really on propagation. And I've added, ah, uh, there's Pauline, who is our our church pastor who is joining us higher. I did some more slides on QSLing, and then at the end there's some general slides which perhaps are subject to um, for discussion depending how the time goes. So I'll, I'll leave it um, to, to see how it goes. I haven't prepared a script. I don't when I do talks. So it's really just talk around uh, what I got on the, on the slides. Um, perhaps a, that, that's my station as it was in 2012, um, which is not that much different to what I got now. It's a K Aircraft K2 on the top shelf. Um, it's quite convenient because of the odd times I go on Zoom, the um, laptop of a computer is underneath the shelf. But people on Zoom, of course, can't see the rig. <laughs> so uh, it keeps the expense of things out of sight. Um, still using the K2. Also on the top shelf is um, the Dayton up converter, which is basically it does north to 30 megs and beyond does um, switchable little. Um, it's probably an early sort of synthesized rig um, as a receiver. I've still got that, I don't use it now, but it's, um, it was focused up on the shelf there. A few QSL cards on the, on the shaft wall. Um, the f previous laptop below, um, a paper logbook, Morse key, uh, the two meter rig, two FT290s below the um, lower date on, with a microphone dangling down, and that's about it. Um, prefix map on the wall. So, um, fairly basic shack. And uh, these are really just for show, showing what you can do with uh, fairly simple stations. Um, I do CW exclusively, but uh, that doesn't mean the talk is, uh, is about CW. It's I'm trying to make it general. This is when I did, I've done a few times, the uh, ITB low power contest, which is July each year, the three watt output, and uh, this is a wooded area at the bottom of Long Hill, and G4DDL's little uh, tent gazebo thing, which I borrowed off him. Let's keep the rain off. So it's just a K2, a battery, and a Morse key, and a, um, a little doublet up in the... Uh, up in the trees. Very simple to set up and uh, work quite well. And the other thing I did quite a lot in those days, not so much in Arizona, so it's on the air. And this is Cleve Hill, which conveniently was on the way to where my brother was living at that time, um, down in the, the um, Cotswolds. So, uh, just the idea of SOTA is that you're supposed to carry your rig to wherever you're operating. You're not supposed to, you can't drive up and uh, um, operate directly from the car. You have to sort of uh, do a bit of mountaineering to get there. Cleve is hardly mountaineering. Um, and uh, Cleve has, perhaps a unique, it has a trig point. Trig points, of course, are hard disappearing now. A trig point in which the little thing which goes in the top was missing. So it was a convenient, nice little hole you could slot a telescopic bust into. <laughs> so the actual point 
<laughs> no. <laughs> I think most twig bodies are abandoned now, effectively, aren't they? They're still uh, there. Well, they're still marked on arrest maps. They yes, still they still them. exist. Yeah, they still uh, as landmarks. Them. They still use them, too. Yeah. But there's um, something about all the survey they have to maintain. Oh, yes. So whether this one was broken or what, but you'd have a convenient hole in it. There's me, and a convenient passerby came along and took my photograph. <laughs> uh, do you have to get permission then to... Um, not, uh, well, not something? normally, it depends where you're going. If you're going, there is something like in some of these Soto summits or on National Trust property, and it's sort of advisable to ask them uh, if you can do it. Somewhere like Cleve, you know, a sort of a, a sort of public space and you know, sort of rambling routes and things. Yeah. You have to be within, I can't remember, it's 50 metres or so height of the, of the summit. So you can, the official summit is, is, is marked, but, which of course is not necessarily where there's a big point. So you've got a free amount of choice. Okay, so that's the show. Right, what um, this talk does to start with is go through the various HF bands and describe their characteristics. Um, there's a few things which, if you start going on HF, you soon get to know. Um, that the lower you go, the bigger aerials you need. And the harder it gets, unless you're in a lovely QTH If you've got loads of sea around you, then you, you win. Um, so in this, our sort of houses, or these bright, bright little town houses, where you haven't got um, big gardens, top band is very difficult. You can do various things with verticals. But, uh, but they're, they're again, you're dependent on what your ground is. And some parts of Brighton are okay. Um, I effectively live on sand. So top band, forget it. And now, of course, with everybody suffering electrical noise, KRM problems, that is usually higher on the lower bands as well. So if you want to, want to struggle, then start on top band. Years ago, of course, many of us, I, I guess Richard did as well, started on top band. Top band AM was the place to be, and there were loads of mobiles on, on top band with a great big mobile whips on, on the cars. You probably don't do it now. <laughs> but that was a thing, you know, in the um, 60s and uh, 70s. And sorry, you know, died out, died out um, obviously, in recent years. So top band um, is the lowest HF band. There is, of course, also 136 kilohertz. And I've said the incoming 500 kilohertz. That's now out of date because we now have got 472 kilohertz, <laughs> which um, some people have done. I've, I've never looked at 472 kilohertz myself. My interest has obviously now gone on in the HF area. But top band in daytime is ground wave up to about 100 miles or so, if you're lucky, a bit further. Um, you don't hear any DX because of the absorption in the ionosphere. here. But after sunset, the D layer goes and potentially we've got a wild world, worldwide DX possible at night. But to do that, you need a decent aerial, unfortunately a decent amount of power, and a lot of patience. Um, say it used to be popular for AM. These days, it's really um, DX and contesting bands, and you won't hear very much in the daytime. There are various groups of sort of, um, you know, top, local top band nets um, out of tradition. Martin might be interested in that. 
say, one of the, I say, I do CW, um, things have changed a lot since 2012 in that we now have these, uh, all these fancy new digital modes. And FT8 and FT4 has rather taken over, which to some extent is good because people can have um, QSOs they didn't use to have before. Um, the same token, a lot of it is click and point, which is perhaps not the probably we're used to. But the worst aspect I see, which people refuse to accept, is that it's moved all the activity away from the physical modes. Now, it is so easy to do it on the click and point. CW and even sidebands, outside contest is, is you know, you get empty bands with nobody about. Hopefully, as the sunspots start coming back, which they are, then that, that will change. Anyway, that top band is that. AT, which Martin knows a lot about, is um, going up in frequency, of course. Again, during daytime, local traffic bands. Um, again, ground wave, but uh, you get some sort of sky effect even in daytime. And uh, you can work PA0 and places like that fairly easily in, in the daytime. But again, after dark, the, uh, the long distance comes in, you can work a reasonable amount of um, DX, you know, WVE. Um, so forth is, is not too difficult, but it depends where you are. If you have QRN, then it will affect you on, on top end. Used to be some of the inter G chats during the daytime were, you know, people used to give them various descriptions, you know, the <laughs> sort of um, old chaps chatting away all, all, all day, but uh, uh, but still some of those, but. I think a lot of them have now wandered off. It's probably, if you, now it's all, the great question is, what band do you use for chatting to G in the daytime? Or at night come to that. And 80 meters is probably the, um, the better band um, for doing that. Because as soon as you go up in frequency, you, you get longer skip and you can't work G. You know, 20 meters you can't work in, you, apart from very, very local uh, Gs. <coughs> uh, I mentioned I used to be club challenge contest, which I used to do eagerly each year, but um, they, they still go on, but I think they're lots of, sort of interest in them these days. 40 meters going up again. Uh, I've left out 60 metres, perhaps because that's a sort of specialist band. In fact, in 2012, it was still, um, you needed an, an NOV, special <coughs> licence to, to work on it. Now, any full licence, but not foundation or intermediate, can, um, can use 60 metres, which at times can be a good inter G band. Um, 40 metres. Yes, you can work a reasonable amount um, in G and uh, into reasonable distance into New York during the daytime. And then at night you can work more or less anything. It's a fairly narrow band, it's 200, 200 kilohertz now, it used to be only 100 kilohertz. So it um, does get crowded at times. And uh, whether you can work G or not, or short skip depends on the largely on the of a solar cycle and the time is of low sunspots, uh, solar minimum. Um, it tends to be um, you get the Europeans, but not the not the local Gs. Uh, so the sunspots come up again, then uh, you, you can do. Uh, quite well into, um, into G-Land. I, uh, I did have originally in a comment about 
sideband operation below 7050 was a problem, but with the expansion of the, um, the band to 200, 200 kilohertz, that's more or less alleviated that. But it doesn't help with the growth of digital, which is also creeping down. <laughs> it's, um, no, we haven't got enough spectrum. Thirty meters um, is the first of the walk bands, which is the not from added in 1979 at the World Radio Communication Conference, which then was called WARC. They seem to drop the A for some reason. It's now called WRC. Um, Fifty kilohertz wide, and. Uh, got a share of other services, including things like the web, weather station in Germany, right down the bottom of the band, and various other commercial things. Um, it is just CW and data. No contests for the same sort of reason. I'm not quite sure, but I said somewhat neglected. I don't think that's quite true. There's, there's certainly a lot of interest in the band and offers, offers good prop European contacts during the day and uh, worldwide DX at all sorts of other times. Now, of course, with data, you can use it if you, if you can't do CW. And when it gets up, up to 20 metres, you're really getting into the um, traditional HF the X bands. 20 is middle of the road in a way that there's always stuff there even in sunspot minimum years. Um, you don't need enormous aerials but um, they're perhaps not as small as you, you, you think. And uh, you, can, you can work some nice stuff. but not G. <laughs> I mean, you, you did the experiment trying to work John on 20 metres, didn't you? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was just smoking them. <laughs> it's, it doesn't work. Um, it's a long time since I've worked, actually, I, I lie, I worked a VK back in the Barrow contest in, uh, in March. Um, it's been it's a traditional band for for VKs, and you know, pe some people have regular skeds every single morning with a uh, friend in uh, down in Sydney or wherever. Um, it has excellent propagation to Italy and Eastern Europe, <laughs> which may or may not be to uh, to your advantage. Seventeen. I put this one for some reason in meters and megahertz <laughs> because I think it actually it, it is the one band in which you more often use what both of them. Where twenty meters, you normally say twenty meters. You will never say fourteen megs. But seventeen, you can um, do either. Another walk band, quite a nice band. If you've got smallish antennas, it's surprising what you can work. It's getting to that magic sort of length where any sort of antenna does at least get out. Um, I've worked quite a lot of nice stuff on there. In the early days, it was relatively quiet because you couldn't get beams and things. You couldn't buy beams. Now a lot of um, antenna manufacturers do do five band yards, which cover the uh, for walk bands as well. So we've had a lot more activity now than it used to be. Fifteen metres. Historically we didn't have fifteen metres. I don't know when we did was introduced, can you remember? It's over in the nineteen fifties or something, wasn't it? Yes it was. 
Yeah, yeah. So it'll be very early rigs didn't even if it gets uh, <laughs> your know, wartime rigs I probably don't have fifteen meters well, fifteen, 15 meters, meters on anyway. When I was licensed, 58, oh as late as that was it? I was I was licensed. Well that's that was there. Oh, it was there then, yes. I, can't, I, I don't think it was, it, it, we had it before the war. No, I'm sure you wouldn't. No. But another band, when you have sunspots. It's been a bit quiet for the last few years, but now the sunspots are coming back. It's uh, beginning to get more active. And when the X is there, you can work it with virtually nothing. I put very much a daytime band. 20 metres nor, it, during a winter month dies at sunset. During the summer, it can stay open right through the night. Twelve metres was the third of the walk bands and uh, can be a good band, um, but when, sun, when there aren't any sunspots, forget it. <laughs> um, it's good for sporadic E during the months, the uh, summer months. And sporadic E, of course, starts in the middle of May, so that's only a month away. So um, get on the, eight, the uh, 10 metres. Um, and 12 metres during the um, May to July, August time, and you can easily work into Europe very easily. <laughs> okay, 10 metres, this is the final HF band. I haven't included 6 metres, <laughs> it's some sort of class as an HF band. Um, 10 metres, some spot minimum. Forget it, white noise, apart from the sporadic heat season. Sunspot maximum, the height of activity, we haven't got there yet. I remember in the 1960, no, 1980-ish, when sunspot maximum, where there was a secret worldwide contest and you could work even with um, peanuts air aerials. You could work W after W after W. <laughs> Magic band, but um, we we're not quite there yet. There is signs of activity. There was a South African station on last night. And so uh, things are beginning to look up a bit. And as I say, good for sporadic E. Um, Probably not so much the case now. Um, TVI seems to have largely gone away now people have gone to digital or they perhaps don't realise why the digital TV has gone off. <laughs> TVI is, used to be a huge problem in, in the analogue days. It's rather less now. Um, I'm not quite sure whether... You know, illegal TV operators, I guess they still are there, but uh, I don't hear them these days, so maybe they've got the hit. Okay, so that's... Um, any questions on that sort of aspect, and the bands and so forth? 29.1, hmm? 28 to 29.7, yes. Yeah. Twenty nine point seven. Um, ah, yeah, oh I see what you mean. Yes. Um <laughs> the yes, the side band well you won't hear much side band above twenty nine point one. But there's satellite stuff up there, um FM repeaters more in, in, in the States. The thing is, it, 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 it's too wide in a way, 10 metres. 
It's nice to be able to have a nice wide band you can use as a transverter band for your two meter transverter. But if you look at the band plan, there are various allocated things up there. It's mainly, it's mainly um, space satellites and so on. Any other questions? I think I'm going to have to start getting up earlier in the morning. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I worked at EK at about 7.30 in the morning, uh, about five or six years ago, and that was with 100 watts. Yeah. Um, yes, I, 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 one thing I didn't say, or I was going to say, is that um, there's a propagation ten, uh, change through the, through the day that in the morning you get propagation to the east and then as it moves through the day you'll find the Americans, East Coast Americans start coming in late morning and then you go out to sunspot, sunset, and around about sunset, you get the West Coast Americans. This sort of east to west change in propagation through the day as the various as their um, sunrise and sunset move. And you get to, to know that sort of pattern. You know what time to go and listen for various stations. And VKZL are usually either first thing in the morning or um, Round about sunset, yeah. and they're very sort of grey, grey, grey path um, related, but not strictly. No, no you can sort of calculate the grey line, but like the, some some signals follow it. Uh, some are sort of you know, it was sitting and we were both in the grey line, so yeah. You can sort of say if if so so if 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 my sunset and his sunrise, there might be a propagation path, <coughs> or might not be. <laughs> propagation is a strange thing that you you can't predict day to day, even if the solar indexes are the same. You don't know what the individual ions there and the ions and electrons are doing. Right, so next section, curacelling, um, which I got, got a few curacels out of my, uh, my cardboard boxes. It still seems to be some sort of magic of paper cards. Um, some people still like to uh, collect them en masse, uh, but I think the old saying that the final, no, what, what's the exact one? The five... what you're, are you saying the QSO isn't over until you've... Um, no, the, 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 final act, the final act of a QSO is a QSL card. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, if you haven't had the QSL card, then... It it, oh, you've been pretty unkind, you're not really, no. It's not really a QSO, but... That's not the case now because so many people use the electronic versions of QSLing. Um, G3TXF users who have loads and loads of user collect cards. I, I've even had you know, a direct QSL card request from Nigel. And, <laughs> but why? <laughs> but yeah, you know, he, you know, he had a large card. No, something like 50,000 cards or sort of. All, all in filing cabinets, cathodes yeah, and the things, but he digitised them all. Yeah, I think he's actually, the last thing I saw him put in well, CDXC was that he... Well, he, 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 he's, moved, he's moved to Austria anyway. Was he? Yeah, that was in the no, digest. No, he, uh, during Covid, for some sort of reason, he decided he wanted to move, he went, wanted to, move to Austria. Because he wasn't vaccinated. Well, <laughs> so, he, so he, he basically sold off his, his house here and everything in it. Right. And part of that, of course, was his uh, yay many thousand uh, cures off. <laughs> so whether they were all went to be uh, the tip, I don't know. But he, but he digitised them. This yes, kind of... 
So anyway, so it's random selection. Um, but what I've five C five T, I sh showed both sides of that, just because uh, you'll see what the way. Although we get nice QSLs printed with nice boxes to to fill in by hand, um, these days you just print off a little label from a computer and stick it on which is that one shows you've got a sort of pre-printed uh, card and you stuck the label on, <laughs> which I do as well. So, yes, cards, cards can be pretty. Um, I've got quite a few cardboard boxes. I've already thrown you know, two or three shoe boxes out, very old, very old cards. Just what do you... What do you do? You collect the card and you put it in a box and that's it. That it yeah. Yes. <laughs> At least you can put them in the blue bin. <laughs> um, right, so that's my card, which didn't quite come out. It, I, I put it through my scanner and you can't quite see there's a, there's a blue map of the world behind that. And it seems to be the, the sort of blue which scanners don't see. <laughs> oh, Xerox machines used to miss one colour, didn't they? Yeah. I think the same sort of thing with this. And, uh, you can, it's, it's faintly there. Um, so I've done exactly the same thing. A nice printed box to write everything off by hand. And I just come along and stick a... <laughs> Printed label out of the other computer on top of it. Got to see easier. Um, I put down there you know, where do you get cards from if you want them printed. You can, of course, go to your lo local print shop. We don't know anything about what a QSL card is, but if you tell them exactly what you want, then they'll do it. Tell us an example. Yeah. What about global QSL? Is that still going? So I, Global QSO. Global QSO, I didn't put that down there, perhaps on purpose. I think it's still working. Right. Global QSL was a process where you could send them an, an ADIF. ADIF uh, uh, stands for blah, blah, blah. It's a sort of a, it's a exchange format which logging software uses of, of your QSLs. Um, you could send them basically your log, and they would then print a batch of cards from from that professionally printed which sounds a nice idea and it was always to be cheap because you could buy yay many cards and then they would actually just print them in batches if, if you sent them I want 200 the 200 yeah, you've got to design your card yes so they provide the software that they can design your card yes which didn't work on that yes and um, you sent them the copies and then they would send them on through, uh, send them on through the bureau, I think. They have to do it through the bureau. They yes. will not do it direct. Yes. Yeah, I had heard reports that people were, had been sat waiting for the car to come through. You know, there's been very very long delays. So maybe. Yeah, I looked at using them and I just never actually got round to paying them anything, so I never actually used them. Oh right, so you you look you didn't did you even design one? No, because the software wouldn't run on my Mac. So right. um, I was going to do that, but I didn't think yes. I was doing it. And at that point, of course, Logbook of the World came along, and so it seemed like that was the way things were going to go. And now we have Club Log, so... Well, that's why I wish we'd move on to in, in a minute. But, um, yes, the electronic means of confirmations have basically taken away a lot of the need for QSL cards. Got to reason yeah, they were... They were, they were made to get your confirmation through um, the AWOL. Um, right, and so down the bottom, UX5UO, Ken, Dad, Kennedy, um, in Ukraine, here's where I got my cards from. You know, a batch of a thousand cards. Uh, no, 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 I'll come to a minute. Um, a, um, I think I found a card for 60 quid or something like that, which I did my design more or less. It's a single-sided card, obviously, if you want um, 
multiple photographs and double-sided things and stuff it goes up. He does a good service and he was closed down for a while, but apparently he, is, he has now been able to set himself up again and he is in, in business again. There were some postings a couple of weeks, a week or so ago. Um, the other one, the overseas one. The overseas ones give very, very good value for money. LZ1JZ, I haven't dealt with myself, but some people have, and uh, I think he does a similar sort of service, similar sort of prices. Yeah. There's uh, loads of advertisements in the back of um, Radcon. Yes. Yes, I think they, they used to be a, a few UK dealers. Many years ago, you'll, some of you will remember A.B. Lou. <laughs> I, I don't think his surname was Lou. He, he lived in Lou. <laughs> everybody said, oh, I'll get a car from A.B. Lou. And uh, he did a, a good service. When I first got my license, got my first batch of cars from him, He's not around now. I think there's one or two still around, but if you look at their prices, it's just a convenient to go to the, um, these overseas ones. Yes. If, you, if you want cards, <laughs> or you can, you can print your, your own, which I, I did do for a while. Um, relatively easy to do, but you end up seeing as printers tend to deal with A4 sheets. You've still got to guillotine them to size and things. So. It was a bit messy. Yeah, it's not so easy to get the alignment right. Then, you know. there, are, there are various software packages you can download to design your own, or design a, a QSL card as which a software designer might think you like. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't too, too impressed with most of them. I think you can get even software that you can print the card and the QSL data in one sort of fell swoop. Um, is there a sort of minimum information that you need to include? Um, um, well, yes, something, yes. Um, well, obviously, call sign, you've got your own call sign and details on. You don't need to give your actual full address. Um, usually, usually, contact these days and email may be useful. Um, but yes, call sign, date, time. And it's actually all that's needed because the, the XCC for confirmation yes, doesn't right. doesn't need a report. But you normally normally you would put a report on preprint five nine nine. And would you use just UTC for the time? Always. Everything in UTC, yes. Yeah. Everything in UTC if it's to do with radio. Yes, one hundred percent. Don't put any other time in your log. <laughs> which you occasionally get cards coming in which they've got an hour at out or whatever because they've got their... Yeah, I mean, at least, at least we have the advantage of only having the information that we need. Yes. Yeah. What annoys me, I've, I've actually, um, groups I owe is like that. They get these um, calendar alerts or downtime things and they put them in, Amer in uh, West Coast USA yeah, time. Yeah. And it says UTC minus eight. Yeah. I thought, hang on, which way is that? <laughs> it's quite confusing. And in internet time. Yeah. Oh, I think you're missing the meeting because they've decided to change the time. Well, and different states change at different times yes. now. <laughs> so it's like, what? Hmm? Well, all the states actually change. The packets, so those types of states that do change, they always end up at the same time. And they? Don't I think, think so, so, yes. I don't think so. Is that, well, unless they've changed it recently. Well, within the last five years, six years, mm. something like that. When they, when they decided to start, so Bush decided he would bring moving to summertime forward by a couple of weeks, yeah, and then... One week later at the end, yeah. At the end, that's right. And then, <coughs> I think certain time zones, Colorado Mountain Time or something like that, decided to um, do it at a slightly different date or something. 
I think I don't think it's everyone at the same time. No, the uh, the American Spring one is a couple of weeks before us. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. Um, how to QSL? And QSL here is the broadest sense, uh, not necessarily a paper card. Um, direct. Now this is when I was chasing the XCC some years ago. Um, quite a lot of the ones you can have it. The ones for the bureau, okay, fine, but it takes time. Direct cards for the expeditions, and the expeditions probably insist that you do that. Is you send them, send them a one of your cards plus dollar bills. It used to be one dollar bill or IRCs. Now I put IRCs down there. They are now really historic. It's international reply coupons. Yeah, you can't, you can't get well, yeah, you, where you could send the IRC to somebody and he could go to his local post office and exchange it for a a single surface stamp to whatever country in the world. Yeah. Um, but but they, um, they then started putting, originally they had no expiry date. So amateurs use them effectively as, as currency because they're, you know, they're not worth any, anything in real money and they're completely just sticking in the uh, QSL card. So one, one IRC originally was sufficient. Um, then, of course, the postal authorities then decided to put an expiry time on the coupons. So they had issue one, issue two, issue three, or whatever.